Assistance, and Jim Colton, Practice Director of Portfolio and Project Management here. I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Gus Chikala founded Project Assistance in 1996 to help com companies achieve better, faster, more cost-effective project-based results. Gus is a recognized portfolio and project management expert who has published many popular articles and books on the subject and is frequently asked to present and teach topics of interest of project management. Gus? Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Jim. And thanks, everybody, who took time out of their busy day uh, to spend time with us this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are. Uh, so today, uh, here's what we're going to cover. Our agenda, we're going to start out with a 50,000-foot view uh, about what we mean by the control tower and how control towers uh, can, can integrate with the uh, flights that are in in, uh, in flight. And uh, we'll go from there uh, into its deeper uh, challenges uh, that, that uh, come at us when we're dealing with this kind of an application. Uh, the way we're going to do the, uh, talk about the challenges is uh, really talk about process theory and, and how inputs and outputs and processes work together to provide those fabulous dashboards the project server is capable of providing, uh, but delving deeper into what do we have to do to really make these things be valuable. Okay, so we'll talk about an overview of process theory, and then we're going to talk about really three primary key performance indicators today about resource capacity versus demand, schedule variances, and cost variances. So really getting deeply into this concept of on time, on budget, and, and, uh, and how we can monitor that through dashboards and how process will support that. Uh, we have a live demonstration of Project 2013 today. Uh, we'll talk about how those inputs are created, and we're going to feature uh, some of the new reporting in Project 2013 as well. Uh, when we get done talking about the demonstration, uh, we'll talk about the improvement methodology, some metrics uh, that support some of the successful ways to approach a project server implementation or a portfolio project management solution implementation. Okay, so we'll talk about the, uh, what's, what we mean by success, uh, what the ROI is uh, when these things are successful, and then a little bit about a methodology uh, that we recommend in order to make it successful. So from a 50,000 foot view, what we like to talk about is when we think about an organization's mission, values, vision, strategy, and execution, there's a point where when we think about how things go from the organization's vision into a strategy, typically that's the point where we see portfolio and project management sciences come onto the scene. Okay, so this idea of how do we in fact deliver on the vision, there's really two layers we want to talk about. One is the strategy and governance layer. Uh, uh, how we propose, select, measure, and respond uh, in terms of how we identify projects, how we build business cases around them, how we compare them to one another, and ultimately come out with hopefully an optimal slate of projects to achieve the, visions, uh, the vision of the organization. Uh, at the execution layer, <clears throat> we have this idea of uh, projects are successful when they're on time, on budget, and on spec. And on spec is important, the software development life cycle, how we, how we deliver projects successfully. But for today's conversation, we're really going to zero in on this science of project management, how we deliver on time and on budget, and how that information is fed up into the portfolio level so that we can do this thing that, that we call measure and respond. How can we know how the flights that are in flight are, in fact, uh, progressing as expected? And if not, what can we do about, about it to get things back on, on course by identifying, first of all, what's off course, and then what actions are, are, are necessary to get back on course. Okay, so, so again, this, this idea that, um, you know, the right projects, if you will, at the top, you know, what, what do we mean by the right projects? It typically means, hopefully, lower risk, higher ROI, uh, cost-effective budgets, alignment to vision, ideal timing, market needs, and specifications so that we, in fact, can do that on time, on budget, on spec, at the point of execution. Okay, so the portfolio control tower, what we really think about is that this control tower really ensures that the portfolio is aligned with the organization's strategy. So we like to use this analogy of um, how we have uh, a number of missions underway, uh, or a number of projects underway to fulfill the mission, and, and, that, and that there's a way for us to uh, monitor the activity 
And typically, you know, in, in Microsoft Project, that, that control tower or that dashboard is really what gives us those key performance indicators. So, so we talk, if we think about the, you know, the airplanes being the projects, and that we in the control tower are really monitoring vital, vital signs, you know, the radar, the altimeter, uh, the things that are uh, telling us about position and whether things are progressing according to plan. Okay, so, so when planes go to the wrong destination or they land on an occupied uh, landing strip or they are colliding with one another, I mean, we want to be make, making sure that we are proactively seeing when things are going to happen. Uh, when, when Jim uh, takes the floor in a few minutes, um, he's going to talk to you about some of the key performance indicators we can look at. And when we talk about, for example, something like a schedule variance, it can be predictive. Right? When Microsoft Project gives us a schedule variance, it can be an actual variance that has already occurred, or it can be a predicted variance, right? Something down the critical path has already moved forward against the baseline. So this idea that we can avoid collisions, we can avoid runway incursions, we can we can avoid place, uh, airplanes ending up at the wrong destination before they before they get there. Okay, so that's really really the, the foundation of what we want to talk about today. So 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 the general challenge that we have here is is you know the, the old saying is what gets measured gets managed. Right, so so are we governing the portfolio? Do we have a control tower? Do we have the the data, the intelligence, really to have the measurements so that we can in fact measure measure what's happening uh, with the plans, uh, with resource? And we get specific beyond the general challenge when we think about resource capacity versus resource demand. Um, there's a, there's a lot of challenges, right? A uniform, advanced resource management capacity capability. For project management and for the tool, so you know how do we how do we get that uniformity? How do we get that standardization uh, that's necessary to be able to get what it says next, which is the accurate and timely input from all projects? So so the challenge we have here is if one project is reporting demand inaccurately, we're going to have a problem understanding uh, what our capacity is. Right? Is there excess capacity? Is there under capacity? Uh, with, without a full complete picture. There's going to be a problem, and and the and, and the real challenge gets down into when you look at, for example, how I know what demand is. It's that specific resource within that specific time frame, with that specific labor allocation to that specific project to that specific intermediate deliverable. Um, that can be daunting to keep up to date on a regular basis. So so we find that this resource capacity versus demand gap identification. It's one of the greatest challenges in using tools like this. Okay, schedule variances. Again, the consistent approach for standard standard milestones. You know, do we have a common language? What I call the phaseolo phaseology phraseology, right? Do we have a, a way of talking about what phases our projects are in, and do we have consistency in that terminology? How do we capture baselines? How do we govern that process? How do we govern the updating and reporting against schedules? How do we promote these schedules at the right time? How do we make sure the right information is, is out there? And, and not only that, but if you ask a project manager why they haven't baselined yet, and a common answer is, um, I don't have all the information yet. Uh, my follow-up question is, when do we have all the information? And the answer is at the end. Right? So, so we can't wait. Right? So at some point, we've got to baseline these projects. We've got to get some kind of level of commitment out there so we can start to measure those variances. And from a cost standpoint, very much the same story. Right? Consistent approach for capturing labor, which drives cost, as well as other uh, kinds of costs. Again, capturing those baselines and enabling um, where that data is going to come from. Right. So if we have a baseline, uh, one of the big questions is, how do I know what my actual cost is? While Microsoft Project is commonly used for tracking time or labor, actual labor, um, it, it's often not the place where we're tracking our costs. So how do we get that interface? How do we get that data at the right level? So these are, these are some pretty big challenges, and we want to go ahead and double click on that by talking just briefly about some process theory. Okay, so if we begin with the end in mind, um, as was, was stated by Stephen Covey in, in The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, beginning with the end in mind with us is this idea of, okay, I want to have a dashboard. I want to be able to see how my projects are doing. So that's the end point, but how do we back into that? Okay, so, so if we think about uh, the, the process of baking a cake, uh, hopefully it starts with a goal, right? Why would you bake a cake? So, so there's always this why question out there. 
And uh, maybe my answer is I want my kid to have a, have a good birthday. We want to have, uh, we like sweets. Whatever your goals happen to be. I like blowing out candles, okay? And then we have, um, uh, how, how about who's responsible, accountable, and consulted and, conf and informed on these things? Who's going to be responsible for the cake? Who's going to get the ingredients? And how about, oh, by the way, in addition to the cook, the shop, and the electrician, and the appliance dealer. Well, wait a minute. Electrician and appliance dealer? I have to think about that. Well, the question really becomes, is there an infrastructure for this process to be successful, right? Do we have, do we make assumptions that in order to make a cake, that there's going to be some level of infrastructure there? Like we assume, and we do, that there's an oven, that there's a recipe, that there's a mixer, that there's electricity, refrigerator, and that there's plates to put it onto, okay? Or maybe candles, maybe fire, we can go on and on, right? So, so that is the background by which we start to say, can, is, is process even in an environment, is it being cast into an environment where it has a chance for success? Okay, so if we have the goals and the, res and, and the responsibilities and the, and the infrastructure, we can now start to think about what are the inputs, what are the transforming steps, and what are the outputs? Okay, so, so if you tell me what your outputs are, then we, then we have to uh, uh, uncover, if you will, what the inputs have to be and how I turn those inputs into outputs. And that's kind of the backdrop of how we want to talk about this, right? So I think about project management process theory. Again, if I look at that foundation or that environmental um, capability or assumption or prerequisite, if you will, okay, what is the goal? And obviously it's, it's to fulfill the business strategy, right? Why do we do projects? Well, we're those vessels that carry the organization to that vision out on the horizon, right? So, so that vision, that business strategy helps us. Uh, uh, RACI, well, it helps if we have project managers to implement process. It helps if we have team members. It helps if we have executives that are going to govern the process or ensure that the business strategy is accurate, that we have the right projects, for example, okay? And how about the stakeholders who are going to guide the process or be involved in the governance or the governing of the projects? Infrastructure? How about technology? How about a project management office or the people to provide the governance? How about the processes themselves? Part of infrastructure. Is there a process that exists to tell us how to use this capability or utilize the capability within our, within our project management or our PPM technology? Very powerful technology. We're probably going to use a subset. We need process for that, right? So we start looking at the interlinking between this people, process, and technology. So from, the, from, from an input standpoint, We've got the methodology artifacts, if you will. Okay, so if we're going to build a project charter, what's my project charter template look like? Uh, what's an optimal example of a deliverable look like? What's that shining example I can use? What's that sample work breakdown structure that I'm going to use to tell me how to do a successful project? How about the transforming steps? Okay, so in general project management processes, but specifically, what are the guidelines for doing resource capacity management? Is it named resource? Is it by role? Is it by department? How are we going to do this? Okay, who's responsible for it? Resource capacity management is one part of it, but then, of course, you know, looking against the baseline of the schedule versus performance in the, and from an actual standpoint, cost management, baseline versus actual performance. Okay, so there, there are the processes we're going to rely on, and the outputs, obviously, would be the deliverables of the project, and from the dashboards we're going to talk about today, uh, variances to schedule, various to labor expectations, variance to uh, uh, gaps in capacity, and again, actually the, com the common out output here is put into dashboards. Okay, so when we talk about project vital signs, again, when we think about this idea of on time, on budget, on spec, we want to just kind of drill in now these things that we've already previewed, okay, from, from, a, from a, uh, a deeper perspective, all right? So what's the goal? Well, I don't know, for dual capacity versus demand, um, if you were to ask uh, a business stakeholder why do they care about capacity versus demand, the answer would be, well, I don't know. We heard last year we didn't make five of our 25 projects because we didn't have enough resource availability. Well, we thought we had resource availability. What happened? Okay, so the goal here is to not have to ask, ask that question at the end, to know proactively with confidence uh, using a, uh, a term I heard when I was at IBM Professional Services a long time ago, the definition of an optimal plan is that everything is, that, is, that, that is known is put into a plan that works. You know, and I've never seen a plan that works really with confidence if we don't know something about our capacity.
Okay, so that's a pretty good goal. The RACI, who are the people involved? Obviously, the project managers, oftentimes uh, the stakeholders, and really the people who own the resource pools themselves, right? Who's going to actually name those resources if we need named resources? And obviously, the infrastructure, right? We have this Microsoft Project Technology we're about to demonstrate to show how this happens. We have the processes, which we already mentioned. All right, so if we talk about resource capacity and resource demand, two vital pieces of input and not static, not stable, changing all the time, right? Resource capacity uh, in Microsoft Project can be used through the calendars. Uh, it can be stated through max units, okay? And, and, and it can be done at the resource um, uh, enterprise level, okay? So we can get this in the server and, and, and get that input uh, pretty accurate. And the demand is that assignment level work, right? That's a, that's a, that can be a fleeting piece of information. It can be a lot of information. It can be pretty granular. And it's that input that we're relying on to get us through this transforming step that says, well, how am I going to maintain demand? Okay, how am I going to maintain resource capacity? Am I really going to load calendars for resources? Are we going to have a process for that? Is every resource out there going to have to tell us when they have a vacation day? Well, it depends. How accurate do you want your capacity to be? Right? Same thing from a demand standpoint. So are the project managers really going to keep that assignment level data up to date at, at that level within the project plans, keep it published on a regular basis, timely and accurate? Okay, so that when we get that wonderful output, that beautiful, uh, what I call golden plumbing when I describe Microsoft Project Server, especially the, the, you know, the output side, to have all that stuff pipe out into these fabulous uh, reports that will show us quite handily, assuming the input's right and assuming the process is followed, uh, some pretty nice looking reports for capacity versus demand and what the gaps are. Okay? As we talk about scheduled variances, again, what's the goal? Well, this is one of the most fundamental goals. Am I, am I meeting the commitments to the business? Do we think from a sense and respond or a measure and respond at the portfolio level that we're following course, that we're on course? Okay? The, the, again, the responsible parties. Who's, who's responsible for keeping schedule updates? Who's going to update the schedule? How often is it going to happen? Right? So, and, and again, the, you know, the, the infrastructure, the technology, the processes. So the inputs, what's the original schedule? What's the commitment? What, what's the business expecting, the stakeholders? What's feasible? from a demand and capacity standpoint to tell us what that original commitment was. We committed to available people to satisfactory goals from a, from a schedule standpoint that will deliver that, that, that benefit that was promised in the initial business case. Okay, and then of course the ongoing inputs with the actual schedule progress as we execute the project. Okay, the transforming steps obviously is updating the schedule. Again, the guidelines, the frequency, the responsibility has to be well stated, and the output giving us that wonderful answer of hopefully schedule variances that are favorable. Um, but oftentimes these are obviously unfavorable as well. And again, they can be proactive, right? They can be forecasts of variances. So uh, are things starting on time? Are things finishing on time? And are they going to continue to do so? Cost, what's the goal? How's my spend and my own budget? Um, am I going to be able to deliver? Uh, both on schedule and on budget, and um, and in order to do that, the original budget has to be baseline. Um, costs are not only labor based, but oftentimes materials based as well. So, you know, what's the strategy to get all that initial uh, intelligence into this into the budget? Um, obviously, updates are going to be an, uh, uh, actual updates to the budget are going to be uh, necessary, and um, both the task and of course the non-task spending has to come in, oftentimes from exterior systems. Transforming steps, update the, update the budget. And cost variances are the output. And again, Jim's going to show you some examples of that. Okay, so, so um, what I'm going to do now is turn it over to Jim Colton, who's going to take this uh, initial discussion and take it a little bit deeper from a, um, from a conceptual standpoint and then to an actual hands-on demonstration. Jim, take it away. Thank you, Gus, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks again for joining us uh, this afternoon. So before we get into the actual application uh, demo, I'm going to go through a few slides that provide some background into how this Microsoft scheduling engine really works. So I guess I'm doing the slides, Jim. 
You're doing a great job so far. Let's keep it rolling. So if you can master the principles of Microsoft Project and really have a good understanding of how this application works, you're going to get much better input into the system, which will provide higher quality and improved data for decision making. So let's start with a uh, fundamental formula within Microsoft Project that work equals actual work plus remaining work. Seems straightforward. So in, as we start the project, and uh, remaining work best basically is equal to estimate to complete. So if we assume, for example, our estimate to complete is 40 hours, we have no actual work yet, then our total work is 40 hours in this, in this example. What Microsoft does as you add actual work, for example, let's say we apply 10 hours to this task, it's going to update remaining work to 30 hours automatically. So when you think about this, uh, the scheduling engine is doing its job. What we need to do as project managers is we need to validate that the remaining work or the estimate to complete is actually still the same. So that's an important principle, pretty basic, but an important principle to keep in mind as we go through the exercise today. One other uh, item of note, so MS Project will plug the current start date to the actual start date once the specified actual work is greater than zero. In other words, once I apply actual work, the, the, at the moment I apply that, it's going to plug in the actual start date. On the, on the flip side, MS Project will plug the current finish date once the remaining work exceeds or is equal to zero. So basic fundamentals but important things to know. Uh, next up, I wanted to introduce the, the uh, algebraic equation. If you can dig back into your high school memories, you've got work, in this case, equals duration times units. And units in Microsoft Project is essentially the percent allocation of a resource. So if you're, again, if you remember algebra, you can take and move duration to the other side. And now I've got duration equals work divided by units. And that, that's the formula that's, that's easiest for me when I think about it. So for example, if, if my work is eight hours and my resources assign 100%, then I'm going to have a duration of eight hours. I simply divide the eight hours of work by 100% or one, and I come up with the duration of one day or eight hours. Let's say that resource is only available 50%. Now I have eight hours of work, 50% units, and my duration is now going to equal 16 hours. So it's a simple algebra, but it's a very important concept as you, as you go through and update your project plan. Now within Microsoft Project, there's three work types, or project task types, they're called in, in project. So you have fixed work, fixed duration, and fixed units. And Microsoft Project out of the box is fixed units task type, which is actually, in reality, probably the task type that you most infrequently want to use. Most people, based on, on their approach to project management, will use either fixed duration or fixed work task types. And it's important to remember and keep in mind which one you're using because the project scheduling tool will respond based on the task type that you select. And the results can be very different. So if you're in the tool sometime and you're making changes, you don't understand why, it's usually because you, you, you don't have a good enough understanding of the task type that's been selected and how the scheduling engine works behind that task type. So fixed work holds work fixed when either units or duration is adjusted. So if you go back to the formula, duration equals work divided by units, uh, as you adjust one variable, it's going to hold a third variable fixed while changing the second variable. Fixed duration does just what it says. It holds duration constant. Fixed units holds units or percentage uh, resource allocation constant. So it's important, very important, to understand these task types 
and how they affect the, the project scheduling engine. We'll show some examples in a couple minutes. The other important thing to keep in mind is, is what, what is a variance in Microsoft Project? Well, first of all, we have to capture a baseline in order to generate a variance within Microsoft Project. Once we capture a baseline, Microsoft computes work variance, for example, equals work minus baseline work. Similarly, uh, cost variance is cost minus baseline cost, and right down through this list. Uh, there's many examples of variance calculations that are done systematically by Microsoft Project. One thing, thing to keep in mind is unfavorable variances will have a positive value, and favorable variances will have a negative value. It's a bit counterintuitive, but you need to keep that in mind because you're subtracting the initial plan minus or the baseline from the actual remaining work. And again, we'll show some examples in a couple minutes. Here's an example of uh, how variance gets calculated within Microsoft Project. So what you have here is prior to calculating or adding actuals, you'll have 40 hours of work and you'll have no content in the variance category. So there won't be anything in any of the variance uh, columns across the board. So no work variances, no cost variances, no start variances, et cetera. Once I apply actuals, you'll then start to see variances appear in that variance column. And again, we'll go through an example in a, just a moment. All right, let's get to that now. I got it. So I'm in Microsoft Project, and I've just created a demo project for today's uh, demonstration purposes. And I've tried to keep it simple here. So I've added a fixed work task. And how do I make it fixed work? It's pretty straightforward. I click on it. I go to uh, task type, and I've made this fixed work. I could change it to fixed duration or fixed units right here. So I've preset these up. And notice uh, Microsoft out of the box uh, provides a one day duration with a question mark. So it's prompting you basically to, to modify the duration. Let's say I have a five duration activity. And what I'm trying to demonstrate here is how the task types differ in Microsoft Project. As you can see, I've changed the duration. Uh, nothing appears in work, and you may have guessed it. I, I need to add a resource. Once I add a resource, work appears in the plan. So I now have Jim assigned each of these tasks for five days. I have 40 hours of work, and you can see I have a five-day duration. So now I'm going to start to collect actuals. Say Jim has put eight hours of work on the fixed work task, and he's also put eight hours in the fixed duration task. Ah, nothing's different yet, right? I still have five hours, or uh, I have 40 hours of work. I have eight hours to actually see remaining work adjusted to 32 hours. I have 40 hours total work. I can increase my work to 16. I think it's predictable what's going to happen here, right? Remaining, you can see it's adjust to 24. Now let's say I, ad I adjust the percent complete on a fixed work task. I go to 50%. So you can see uh, Microsoft changed the actual work to 20 and the remaining work to 20. How about for fixed duration? Same thing, I'm good to go. But what happens when my remaining work is adjusted? So I've worked 20 hours on an originally 40 hour scheduled task. I adjust, I now have only 10 hours remaining. I'm proceeding faster than I planned. 
And this is the big step within Microsoft Project in keeping your schedule current. You can see now there's a lot of changes depending on the task type. I still have 30 hours uh, is my total work plan. But look at the percent complete. For a fixed duration task, it's stating that I'm only 50% complete. Where fixed work, I'm, it's saying I'm now two-thirds of the way complete. And the reason being, right, fixed duration held that duration constant. I still have five days of work. I've completed two and a half days, so percent complete is based on duration, that calculation. So I'm 50% of the way through from a duration perspective. Fixed work is based on the amount of work. So I'm two-thirds of the way through the actual work. It's showing 67% complete. So you can see a major significant difference depending on the task type that you selected. So let's go and update percent complete. Let's say I've now completed 100% of the work. If you notice, the duration of the task stayed the same for fixed duration. When I complete 100% of the work with fixed work, it, it moved that duration, right, to a, a quicker duration. It modified the actual finish date. Again, a major significant difference and how Microsoft Project treats these different task types. So you really have to understand how these work and mic what Microsoft is going to do based on your input. In, in summary here, it, with this exercise, you know, be sure you understand the task types and how they work. A best practice is not to modify percent complete in your plan. It's to record actuals either through time entry or through uh, project manager updating the actuals in the plan, and then to re-estimate remaining work based on the estimates to complete that you receive you know, through your team members. OK, let's move to a baseline example. If we move down, focus down here on fixed work task two, fi fixed duration task two. Similar example, I'm going to make the duration five days. I'm going to assign a resource. And you can see I've got 40 hours of work. They're both five days duration. Now let's go to a different view within Microsoft Project. So I've created a baseline view, which is going to allow me to see just a different view of the data. Now you can see I've got total cost of $2,000 based on my cost per resource. I've got no baseline yet. So I've got a variance of $2,000 because I have no baseline. I've got actual zero. I haven't recorded any actuals of yet. I'm going to go back to the original view. And I'm going to baseline the project. So I go to project. I want to schedule it, set the baseline for the entire project. And I could do this from either of the views. Well, what, what do you think happened to the baseline? Go back to baseline comprehensive. Well, it recorded the baseline. Now I have a variance of zero, which is, which is accurate, right? I have Variance equals my original uh, total cost minus the baseline cost. I have no variance. So what happens when I start to record actuals within the plan? I've got my baseline. I'm starting to accrue actuals. So let's say I've spent 16 hours. on each of these tasks, but now I have more work than I originally planned. This is tougher than I had thought. My, my estimate complete is no longer 24 hours, it's, it's 32 hours.
I go back to my my baseline view, and we're going to see what happened to to the plan. Well, as expected, I've now got some variances. I've got a cost variance here, and I could add other columns to see different variances. So I could go in and I could look at my my finished variance. So I'm going to add another column here. Simple enough, right? Whoops. Sorry. Add an actual start. I can scroll down to it, and I see my finished variance. So, wow, what does that tell me? Look at the fixed duration task versus fixed work task. With fixed duration, it, the, the, the duration stayed the same. It's still five days. The schedule is telling me I have no variance in duration. But with fixed work, yeah, I, Gus is giving me a thumbs down. I don't like that. It's not really what I, the result I expected. Um, unless I'm working overtime, I'm not going to be able to bring this in as scheduled. I'm actually going to have to work that extra day. So a fixed work task says I have both a variance in cost and schedule. But with fixed duration task type, I only have a variance in cost. So hopefully you, know, you can grasp the concept of it's important to understand both the task types, how they work in the Microsoft Project Scheduling Engine, as well as the concept of baseline. And it's, it's critical to understand that in terms of getting good data in so ultimately we can get good data out of the system. I'm going to show you a few other features of the tool to ensure that you get good data in. So let me switch to another project plan that's a little more comprehensive. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at uh, a task usage view. And within the details, I'm, I'm really most concerned about work and actual work. So I'm going to select those, deselect cost. And what I'm mo most interested in is work that has been planned for the past that did not get completed. So in the task usage view, I can quickly look and see work that was scheduled for June and July. I'm now in August, right? I have work plan that was not actualized. And this is probably the most common uh, mistake or issue within project plans that I see on a day-to-day -day basis. There's work that was planned for the past, it didn't get executed, but it hasn't been moved to the future. I wish I uh, had a time castle and I could go back in time and execute the work back in June, but I can't. Another way to look at that is in the details view. So I click on a task. I see who was assigned this work. And it's a fair amount of work. And it was scheduled to start in June. So Sarah and Jim either had other priorities or they were slacking. Right? They didn't get to this work. You can see the schedule start date. So I can do one of two things. I can go through line by line and correct the start dates and move these into the future. Or I could do a, a universal move all the tasks into the future, which is a little bit dangerous. So typically what I like to do is move to the work into the future one by one, giving careful consideration to the resources that are assigned when they can actually do the work. And you can see the dates start to shift. The other option again, not usually recommended, is I can go back into my Gantt chart. I can select project. And what I can do is update all the tasks and move, move the 
work that has not been completed into the future. So I update the project. Let's reschedule the uncompleted work. And let's start it. Let's start it now, right? Let's start it August 20th. I can select a subset of it, the project or the entire project. For demo purposes, and I wouldn't recommend this, I'm going to select the entire project. So you're going to see what happens when I go back to that task usage view. You're going to see all that work that was had been planned in June, July. It's now all been moved into August and beyond. And this is one of the, the fundamental reasons, again, that projects are not accurate. Because the work that's been planned for the past did not occur, the, the activities and tasks did not get completed, but we're still showing uh, dates that are now you know, in, invalid. So when I get back to the baseline view, let's go to that now, you're going to see uh, probably, you know, a lot of variances. Because I've just moved a ton of work that was scheduled for the past, and I've moved it into the future. Again, I don't have a time capsule to go back in time. I need to do all work. I have to plan all work for the future. So again, I think it's important to master and understand how the Microsoft Project Scheduling Engine works, how it operates, and understand the task types, uh, get a good comprehension of what baselining is, and understand how to keep your project current and accurate. Uh, these are just a few of the many recommended procedures for getting good data into the system. All right, now that we've seen how to get data in, let's talk about Let's how, how do we get the data out? And Microsoft Project Server 2013 has a tremendous amount of uh, options in terms of how to get good data out of the system. So first of all, you can go back to Microsoft Project, and they've done some great work in terms of out-of-box reports within Microsoft Project that they haven't had in the past. So I can go to Reports. I can go, I can go to Dashboards. I can get a nice project overview report. Shows things like percent complete, milestones that have been due, late task, percent complete by phase. And I can, uh, if I understand how to use uh, Microsoft Project Excel pivot tables, I can modify these, these graphics very quickly. I can export these to PowerPoint or Word with the click of a button and deliver this nice report. There's other nice reports in here. So I'll go to report. I can get a nice cost overview if I'm concerned with cost. What's my cost? The overall cost, remaining cost, what percent complete, et cetera. So very easy to configure these. Uh, again, it's kind of right out of the box. Uh, how about progress? Look at schedule reports. Let's see a milestone report. What are my late milestones? What's coming up next? What's completed? And what remaining tasks do I have? Again, I can I can copy this report. I can uh, move it right over to Word, and I've got a nice, very good-looking report right in Microsoft Word. I can send that to my sponsor. Let's look at options within Project Server. So one, one of the options that I like the most is to go to Project Center. I go to Project Center. I can look at views. I can pre-configure different views. I can have a summary view, which shows health. I can pre-configure, and it's uh, fairly straightforward to do this. I can add any columns that I want. This is a cost summary view. The beauty of this is I can export this to Excel. I can make a few modifications, and I have a great, a great looking uh, dashboard report for executive management. You probably have better uh, 
Excel skills than I do, but as you can see, I, I can build a report here pretty darn quickly. within Microsoft Excel, exported directly from Project Center. Uh, a, a next, the next area I want to show quickly, uh, resources. This is a capability right out of the box within Project Server. I can go to resources. I've pre-configured a view to look at project management resources. I can go to the resource availability view and start to look at the supply and demand of resources and where my shortfalls are. So in this graphic, I'm looking at an annual view of resources from January 1st through 1231, looking at it by month. The black line is the capacity of resources based on the percent available for projects of each of those resources. And the bar graphs are displaying the demand for each of those resources. And in summary, I'm seeing the demand for project managers. Each column is the demand for project managers by month. Anywhere where the demand, or the, the colored graph bar is over the black line, I have a shortfall in resources for that month. So it's, at, a, at a glance, I can quickly see in the months of February, March, April, and into October, November, December, I've got some resource constraints. I, I'm challenged. I need, I need to find external resources or I need to modify scheduled start dates. I, I need to look at my uh, triple constraints and make some modifications. The details are also down below. So I can go to any of those resources and see all the projects that they're assigned to, how many hours per month. And again, I can modify this view to go weekly, quarterly, or even down to the day. Not recommended by the day, but it's there for your use. Start simple, you know, start with quarters or months and, and get gradually better at this. Uh, real quickly, just to wrap up, and I'm going to hand it back to Gus. There's some other great reporting options that are available. Uh, there's an out of the package uh, product called EPM Pulse, and I'll jump right to those dashboards. At a click of a button, I can get a really nice uh, project status report. For a nominal investment in uh, EPM Pulse, this is uh, hi just highly configurable and a nice graphic view. This, this was exported to a PDF. I can also uh, utilize SSRS, SQL Server Reporting Services, to generate uh, some, some detailed reports. This is an example of one that can be generated uh, from uh, SSRS. So, Moral of the story is, let's get the right data in. That's the hard part. We can make pretty pictures. We can get the data out pretty simply. It's having the discipline and the knowledge on how to, to make sure that the data is correct in the system to keep your plans current and up to date. And that's going to uh, allow good data to be generated, generated out of the system. Gus, I'm going to hand it back off to you. Thank you, Jim. Great job. Showed me a thing or two I didn't know about. I'll catch up with you later on that. Please do. <laughs> okay, so to your last point, Jim, you know, the this idea of, uh, you know, where's the challenge, and it, it's really creating those inputs to make those wonderful outputs. Uh, I just want to just spend a couple of minutes before we open it up for questions um, about what we call the improvement methodology, right? So this idea that, you know, if you tell me what your outputs are, um, I can tell you what inputs you need, right? So, so if you tell me you're trying to know the gap between capacity and demand, I can tell you you're going to have project managers, you know, stating work as as Jim showed so in, in great detail. Um, you know, the amount of it, the, the amount of sort of process and, and data that are going to have to come together to do that, right? So, so once you know what your inputs are, um, it's going to kind of drive the process, and there lies the challenge, right? So, so, so if you've got a a nice elegant looking output, it wouldn't be uncommon for us to do a project server install and have a customer say, you know, we really want to get to that capacity versus demand. And, and, and you know, my first reaction to that is is a question, which is, gosh, do you really understand what it means to get that in input across a wide swath of project managers? And the sophistication of process is going to have to be standardized across a wide body of folks. So so we would just sort of want to talk about that, that, that disconnect. You know, how do we get that disconnect cured between 
I need the input, and therefore I need the process in order to make the output meaningful. And um, you know, we can't rely on the Moses model, right? So I, I, I talk about the Moses model a lot. You know, it's it's the PMO or the senior executive that sort of hands hands down the stone tablets from the mountain that says, you know, thou shalt uh, enter demand or else. And it's it's a little bit more complicated than that, right? I mean, we we like to say that you know a project imp implementation does not end at the implementation. Um, it, you know, it, it requires adoption, and to get adoption, um, it requires effort and time, right? So, so um, there there are challenges with the process. Clearly, um, having um, the knowledge that Jim just displayed in terms of the unit, the fixed units and the fixed work and the fixed duration and how you manip manipulate manipulate these things, and frankly, how often it changes, right? So, so that can really uh, create some pretty success, um, uh, significant challenges, and the success factors. <clears throat> behind this, obviously, are there is often an embedded culture that that's resistant to change. It's it's a level of rigor, right? Uh, so so there's there's new processes that are more rigorous than they haven't been in the past. Uh, so that that creates its own uh, sort of critical success factor that says how are we going to get familiar and um, really to decide what's right for the situation. You know, are we ready to do? Uh, capacity versus demand. I mean, the reality is, if you can't do project well on your desktop, don't do it on the server, right? Because all you're going to take is information that's not accurate on the desktop and put it in the dashboard that, frankly, isn't timely or accurate. So, so, um, so when we talk about the implementation of portfolio project management solutions like Project Server, uh, we have this idea of success and failure. I want to just spend 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 a, a minute here on. Well, we see three flavors of, of unsuccessful outcomes. There's the failed implementation. We never even got the technology and processes implemented. There's the implemented and not adopted, what I call not software, but shelfware. Okay, so we bought the project. Uh, we bought the project server. We ran the implementation. We installed it. <clears throat> uh, it was too hard, and, and, and we abandoned ship. And the other one, which is fairly common, is implemented with li limited capability. So, we tried to get to capacity uh, demand management, but we ended up with a scheduling tool. But we tried to do a timesheet system, um, uh, you know, and, and we didn't get the, to the enterprise solution. We just got timesheets, but we didn't get the benefits of what we were really trying to accomplish. So what we consider successful is it's implemented, it's planned, and designed. So if we set out a goal to do capacity versus demand, we got there. That's a big one. Okay? It delivers the expected value. Okay, so why did we do this to begin with? What was the business case for doing a portfolio management system? Hopefully there is one, and we'll talk about that in a second. And and, and that it sticks, right? And, and sticking means it matures and improves over time. Okay, that the portfolio and project management process uh, typically will have an increase in rigor. It's usually not all done in one phase, so what do those follow-on efforts look like to, to uh, take it to another level? Okay, so, so why do it? Well, um, Project execution, uh, in, uh, typically with a PPM that's successful, a solution that's successful, we'll see project execution improve by 50%. Uh, the customer satisfaction in the stakeholder land is, uh, increases by 36%. Employee satisfaction even goes up, especially if, for project managers on the phone. You can appreciate this, right? Give me some support. Give me some tools. Give me some capability to actually do my job, which is to deliver on time, on budget, on spec. Okay, so. So even if we if we if we tamper this down to a 15% efficiency gain, a $10 million annual portfolio spend would would save a million and a half dollars a year, right? So what do we talk about? Uh, so how do we achieve that return, right? And, and we talk about this thing we call uh, a via a vision implemented and adopt, and and the first step is to do what we call a vision step. So um, to do a current state analysis to really understand. Are your processes rigorous now? Are they ready? Right? What's the future state? Are we going to try to get to something as rigorous as capacity versus demand? So what are the long-term improvement goals? And then really what has to change, right? So so what would what would the roadmap be to build to, to fill the gap between current capabilities and desired capabilities? And how do we turn those inputs into outputs by int introducing a new level of rigorous processes? Okay, so so we call that VIA, which is vision, implement, and adopt. The, the vision step is really to bring together that vision of process technology, people and organization, and governance, how those puzzle pieces fit together. Okay, so we look at that current state, future state gap analysis, work with you to, to develop that vision, 
and put that roadmap down. So there's a thinking stage before implementation, right? So that, that thinking stage really results in um, an assessment of the current state, a vision of the future state, and really what I call the project project, a plan that looks like a project that says how are we going to get there and have that thinking happen such that requirements are bound when we get into an implementation that then looks at how we're going to pull together process technology, people, capabilities, which is training, right? So to get that process well defined, to get that software installed and configured uh, to that future state, right, to get the customization if necessary, to get the education in place, and ultimately to get an implemented solution, but implemented isn't quite as good as adopted. So when we think about governance, it really comes down to that additional what I call sidecar process that says, what are we doing to ensure process improvement? What are we go doing to govern ongoing operations? What are we doing to make it not optional and not just be a Moses model that hands stone tablets down from the mountain? but in fact engages at a governance level to drive the adoption, okay? So the success metrics uh, uh, that we've seen is without, um, with a technology-focused implementation that doesn't do a vision stage, we see less than 15% of these things actually being successful to the definition that we just talked about, right? In other words, they're in one of those three failure modes, okay? With a vision phase, we see greater than 75% success rate, and with an implementation, um, accompanied by vision and adoption, we see the numbers, I won't guarantee it, they're greater than 90% in terms of, of in terms of uh, success. So the key deliverables out of the vision step I touched on briefly, uh, and I, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to stop there at the moment because we're running out of time. So really the point here is if you're looking at, you know, in a typical investment of, a, you know, hundred to four hundred thousand dollars you know, is, is there a willingness to spend uh, so a, a relatively small percentage of that spend to get, you know, the, sort of the assumption I think a lot of people make is if we make the investment, we'll see those metrics. And the answer is, well, no, not really. You can make the investment and still not succeed, right? So our, our whole mantra is, you know, what do you have to do to succeed? Okay, so making that investment and doing those current state and, get, and taking that upfront thinking time is really what we're recommending. And um, so as we wrap up here, it's really about driving execution to deliver on, on business strategy, right? There's, a, we, there's, a, there's a, a number of offerings on our website. This shows the four that really are around making PPM successful on the Microsoft platform. Uh, talk about parting gifts quickly here. Um, there, there's a chapter we'll send you, the, the reporting chapter actually. Um, our book on Amazon is number one selling in Project 2013 training. So we'll, we'll go ahead and send you the new stuff um, in, in, Project, in Project 2013, Chapter 15, okay? Uh, we'll give you a promotional code to get 15% off our book if you want to buy it on Amazon. Uh, we're doing a project uh, online training event. Um, if you attend it today, you get a 10% discount or 60% off of that event. Uh, we'll give you downloads for the slide deck and recording of today's webinar and, uh, and, and links to the how-to videos. A uh, very popular hit on our website. Okay, so I know we're at 401, and uh, we're pretty much out of time, but we did get, I know, at least one question. For those of you who can stay on, please do. If you can't stay on, uh, here's contact information. Uh, we will email everybody who's registered for this webinar with our parting gifts. And I will turn it over to Daniel to add, ask uh, at least one question. All right, thanks, everyone. And, uh, and thanks, everyone, who's willing to stay on for the added question and answer. And you can submit any further questions if you feel like staying any later or uh, through the meeting console. So one question we have here is, uh, what would you say to a project manager that does not believe he needs a schedule, but just simple s spreadsheets to manage a project when the norm is complete schedules? Well, I got the fast answer and the longer answer. And uh, thanks for submitting the question, by the way. I saw that come in <laughs> pretty early. The fast answer, IBM used to have this thing they called a condition of employment. So if we have good governance processes, um, you know, it, it's it's linked to, to basically, you know, this is your job and, and, and there's ways to make it not optional. I think the, I think the more maybe, um, and that's what I call, you know, going through the criminal justice system, right? We can dismiss you by not doing your job. But, I mean, from a from a logical standpoint to say, well, why, why would we demand somebody has something like a schedule or using a scheduling tool? And I always go to this question, um, I like to ask people when they say, why are you using a spreadsheet? Right, and, and, and a very, very common answer is, first of all, we know it. Well, project looks like a spreadsheet, so why don't you use project? Well, uh, Excel doesn't change my dates. Well, 
well, hold on a second. Um, so you don't want your dates to change? Well, no, we're not allowed to change our dates. Well, don't dates change anyway? So I think the fundamental question is, you know, and we really try to emphasize this in our training, is, you know, can we use a tool like Microsoft Project because we're not afraid of it, right? And some of what Jim showed today is what I call coughing it up, right? Making, instead of doing the 10-day or two-semester uh, uh, training uh, exercise, we can have to teach you all the ins and outs of the scheduling engine, and we can do that if you want to. But I would recommend something more simple, which is to understand how to apply, apply the views and the tables and insert the right columns that really reveal what that black box is doing. The project scheduling engine feels like a black box, but it's not if you know how to use the views and the tables. So, so um, I, I certainly, I think the argument is, um, well, what's the value? Well, the value is project will tell you what reality is bringing upon us, right? When Jim talked about bringing old, old dates into the future, I mean, the reality is when you do that, your schedule's going to move, right? And, and even though it may not be allowed to move, I think it's important to show some what-if scenarios to say, here's what's going to happen if we accept reality. And at some point, we have to accept reality. So thanks for the question. If, if, it, it, if it didn't give you the right answer, uh, Dan's uh, email address is up here. And you know, please contact us, and we're happy uh, to answer any other questions. Do we have, do, do we have any other questions? Uh, we do have more questions coming in, and uh, most of you guys are staying on, so might as well give what the people want. Uh, another question we had was, does baseline work on a schedule that is not cost-loaded? That's a great question. So there's, there's, uh, there's five uh, baseline fields. And I'll see if I can jump to that um, that slide real quickly. So this in this example here, uh, the baseline column, uh, we're really skipping actual and remaining. You've got work, cost, start, finish, and duration, right? So if you if, if for example uh, you're not loading resources to a schedule or your or your resources uh, uh, rate is set at zero, your cost will be zero. But that doesn't stop project from from tracking labor. And it doesn't try to st stop it from tracking dates. So I would say, yes, that's fair. Yes, we see our project manager is not responsible for budget. Uh, fairly common in, uh, in cost center project management, which would be something like IT, where our resources are a sunk cost, so we're not necessarily tracking their costs. Um, there's an average departmental rate of $80 an hour, or whatever the number is. And so if you tell me what the labor is, I already know what the cost is, frankly. Um, so I would say absolutely yes, and uh, uh, one of the things Jim showed was applying a table. There's actually a table called the baseline table, and what you would see is um, your labor, your work field would, would be filled in, your start and finish and duration fields would be filled in, and, uh, and your cost field would be at zero. So very, very fair thing to do if that's what the organization wants. Any other questions? Uh, yes, we have another one. Is the project summary report out of the box, or is that a custom report? I'll let Jim answer that one. Depends which one we're talking about, I guess. But you had two, right? Yeah, depending on which one uh, you're referring to. The uh, everything that I showed within Microsoft Project is out of the box, just configurable. The uh, I think I also showed an e EPM Pulse. Uh, oh, Gus handed me the screen here. Yeah, I showed a couple of summary reports. This one uh, would have to be configured, and it, it does require a, a EPM Pulse plugin, which is a fairly insignificant investment to get some really nice looking reports. The Microsoft Project report is out of the box. Um, so things like this milestone report, again, if you can use a pivot table, um, you, can, you can modify the uh, charts very quickly. But yeah, this is right out of the box, plain vanilla. And that, that report uh, tab that Jim's showing there is new to Project 2013. So uh, in that chapter that we're going to email out to all of you, you will see uh, some pretty detailed treatment of how to use some of these reports. Anything else, Dan? All right, well, thanks a lot for uh, staying on extra time, Gus and Jim. And uh, thank you, all of you, for attending, and especially to all of you who uh, saw the value in staying on for an extra 10 minutes. Thank you, Dan, and thank you all. Our webinar will be posted within the next day or so, so if you want to share it with anybody, that should be available to you. Thank you. Thank you.